the recording just started. Thanks, David. Um, how are we finding individuals whose behaviours identify them as lovers of that project subject? So again, if you have booking data and you are putting together, for example, a syndicate for a venture in Britain opera, how are you finding people that identify themselves as a Britain fan? Um, your first step would be looking at people who have donated to Britain operas with you previously. And that information should be um, very easily accessible and, and at the tips of people's fingertips, um, either those that have been in the organization for a while or it will be in your CRM almost certainly. Um, look at audience members who've booked for every single one of recent Benjamin Britain operas that you've produced. Um, they may not book for everything in your season, but if you find someone, and that's actually particularly interesting if they're not booking for everything in your season, but that they have definitely booked in for the last four, five, six productions of, of Britain operas with you. Have a look at their booking patterns, where they booked at those operas. Have you found people that have booked large groups? Or something we do a lot of um, analysis of is where people, where audiences have booked for more than one performance in the same run. So if you did a Billy Budd last year, did someone come to that show four times? That's kind of a, um, a big alarm bell of this person loves Ben Britton. Um, we talked last week about booking early. Have a look at that too. So when did someone book that Britain opera with you? Did they book the day it went on sale? That is identifying them probably as a big fan of that, of that artist, of that composer. Um, you can also think about if you run um events around your season um as as we do uh has have audiences booked for insight talks about that composer in the past they would again be be great um prospects uh for your syndicate um we would then look at all of the above everything i've just um talked about there for composers uh who um it was of similar repertoire so, for example, when we were shortlisting prospects for a Britain syndicate, we'd also look at Tippett, for example. Um, when we are looking for prospects for a Gilbert and Sullivan syndicate, we'd look at other operetta like Offenbach or Laha. Um, so that's in your sort of database. Um, we also look at members of fan societies um, and we cross reference them against our audiences and particularly against our members and donors. So can you find membership of the Wagner Society, if you're looking for a Wagner syndicate, and cross-reference those members of the Wagner Society against people that you know, love your organization, have capacity because they're given to your organization before, and might be interested in the syndicate, um, or against the Gilbert and Sullivan Society, et cetera. Um, I would also look at fans of the artists involved in the production, not just the lead artist, i.e. an opera, the composer, but is there a singer or a director or a designer that you know is particularly admired by a donor? That's probably not the desk research we were talking about last week. That's probably more the research that you do in person, the, the conversations that you have with all of your members and your donors. Um, I would really recommend keeping informal or formal records of the conversations year round that you're having with your donors, even if you're not. So you might be talking to a donor tomorrow and they tell you that they, gosh, they just love Benjamin Britten or they love that particular director. If you don't have a syndicate coming up for that, just bank that information somewhere so that when you do, you can come back to it. So when we produce some Strauss, for example, um, in the future, at some stage in the future, um, I know through the conversations I've had last year in a season where we haven't produced Strauss and aren't intending to or don't have it programmed, but I know now through conversations with my donors that there are people I'm going to come back to. Um, a sort of top tip for self-identifying in here is that we try and drip feed all news of syndicate activity we're having with our wider membership. So we have a, uh, a newsletter that goes out weekly to our members, you probably have something similar, where we have a special event or a, so we had a, a trip to a um, Egyptology museum around Akhenaten, which uh, one or two syndicate members came to. We wrote a short report and included a, a photo 
of that um, uh, of that trip uh, to our to our wider membership who were not invited. Um, and at previous organisations where we've done that, I have had people come to us with frankly complaints saying, "I wasn't invited to that event, but I love that composer, or I love that production, so I'm a bit cross." Um, and that's a fantastic way of self-identifying yourself as a as a prospect for that syndicate if it's not too late or for future ones. Um, and I have had people get in touch and say I was I was upset not to be invited to that event, who have then joined the syndicate. Um, so cultivating. So you've identified your prospects through looking at previous repertoire. Um, so uh, again, I would go back to the that very direct, short, snappy email inviting someone for a coffee that we talked about last week. So something like. I'm writing to you today because I know you're a Britain fan based on having seen that you came to the last six Britons that we produced the Coliseum. I wanted you to know that we're producing a Peter Grimes next season and would love the opportunity to discuss um, getting closer to that production by joining a syndicate and inviting them for a coffee. So that, that kind of um, short form email that we talked about last week works perfectly here. Um, we also put together a syndicate pack um, for uh, prospects which gives them some context to the opera generally. They probably, if, if you identify them as a prospect, they probably know the opera or know of it. Um, but it might be that you've identified them as a contemporary contemporary opera fan, and it's a contemporary opera, so they don't know it um, because it's, it's either a commission or it's brand new. Um, so you get some context about the piece. You're telling who the artists involved are. Um, anything about the production that's particularly special, why you're programming it, why it's important to your organization now, and then an opportunity to get involved and how they might get involved. So they have something hard in their hands, but I would advise not just blanket emailing that or blanket posting it. You wanna be with that supporter in their company when you're putting it into their hands. Um, I would also recommend cultivation events. Um, so we've had a, a number of cultivation events for our next season syndicates uh, here recently at ENO. A cultivation event um, brings together a large group of those prospects at something which gives them a taste of membership. So for example, that, that event I um, talked you through last week where we had the director of the production talking about uh, his love of that opera and his interpretation of that production and, and what he will do with it this time. Um, is a great way of bringing it together. It's an inexpensive way. It's a great use of your time. Um, I would, I think, to make those events um, productive, be really direct yourself, you, the fundraiser, you, the person that's going to go to the supporter or rather the prospect after the event, um, and you make an appeal for support. They have to know why they're in the room. Don't go softly, softly and just give them a lovely evening and a glass of wine and send them home open the event with saying we are here tonight the whole reason we're here is to find supporters for this production and i'd like to talk to you tonight after the event after the you know talk about supporting it and then close on the night if they're if they're good prospects if you've done your prospecting right they should be really excited about joining this again go back to last week about the confidence that you are going to improve this supporter's life by them joining a syndicate about repertoire that they love. I think it's important when you're thinking about cultivating um, supporters for a syndicate, you will give them lots of benefits. You'll give them a great time. But I think as with almost everything we do in, in philanthropy and with major donors, I think make sure you're selling the membership on the principle, not on the benefits. You want that supporter to make a gift to the production primarily because they love the repertoire, they want the repertoire to be continued to be produced um, and for the idea of being involved in a, in a given group that enables that. You want to avoid the trap, which hands up, I've fallen into countless times and I'm sure we'll continue to, but try and avoid the trap of getting donors too excited, uh, or rather getting excited about the production, but too excited about all those additional events and insights and benefits that you put around it. And then they're checking the dates of the opening nights and the syndicate events and deciding not to support because of clashes in their diary. We know our major donors are busy and they spend a lot of time outside the UK and other people's performances. If they find, well, there are, there are eight syndicate events and I can't do four, 
so it doesn't feel like I would, then, then you'll lose that, that gift. Some donors um, we've had here and I've had at previous organizations, for whatever reason, have actually made very few of the syndicate events, but have still had an excellent experience because of all, all the thanking, all the making them feel special you've done, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, they still had an excellent experience and would do it again. Um, so really try not to sell too hard on attending these special events. The other thing you can do is make sure you're booking this in early. So be thinking now about syndicate events or, or, or projects that you want to raise money for in 12 months time, 18 months time, two years time. Um, avoid clashes, get in the diary first. As soon as you have programming from your artistic team, your programming team, your curators, whoever it is, as soon as you have that programming, start pitching your syndicates. Even if that programming is not public knowledge yet, I think you know that's a, that's a conversation you may need to have internally, but our artistic team are very happy for us to talk confidentially with a small number of major prospects before any programming is, is announced publicly. And that's really important because by the time it's announced publicly, it's often too late. So how do you make the syndicate feel special for donors? Again, this image you have on your screen here is a core of our workshop. That's a, it's a great way of making that experience special for donors. It's one of those things that um, members of the public would never have the opportunity. And even our, our members and major donors don't have the opportunity to go to our um, costume workshop to meet the people that make the costumes. And you can see here kind of early designs and sketches and, um, and then they might even get to feel the costumes up close. Um, so to make the donor feel really special through that process, you wanna make them feel part of the team in whatever way that means for your organization. So bringing them in early, making sure they know about the repertoire, about the artists involved, et cetera, before anything's public, makes them feel really special. Giving them special access through the rehearsal period, having them come and sit at the back of rehearsals or um, even if, if appropriate, you know, in conversations between creatives, um, not programming conversations, obviously, but any sort of insight and Q and A and um, those sorts of things, giving them regular contact with your artists, uh, artists involved in the production. And I think making creative, personal and repeated thanking. Think about how you can thank this donor. Um, something that we did really well at English Touring Opera and, and do well at English National Opera too, is getting a, a, a thank you into the home of your donors. So can you have a, a framed, nicely framed production image with a sort of, you know, credit at the bottom that the donor might hang on their wall? Having that in their home will remind them year round about their gift and how, um, how special that experience was for them and might keep them close to you. The other nice thing about getting in people's home is that when they have friends over, they might see this and, and ask why they have an image of a, uh, an English National Opera production in their home. And they say, well, I supported it and I went to this rehearsal, I got close. And they are doing the, the they're sort of cultivating of their friends for you too. So um, it, that might have a bit of an added bonus. But making that, that thanking really personal and special is so important. So I talked about the flowers on the opening night um, for singers that are given by the member of the syndicate, which you obviously arrange and organize, the thank you on stage, handwritten notes. So when someone agrees to join a syndicate at a major gift, can you arrange for the conductor or director or the artist, um, uh, whoever is leading that, that project for you, to write them two lines of a thank you that you put in the post to them. So they've had a really personal thanks. What to avoid. Uh, so um, so that's the, um, sorry, just to wrap that bit up, the um, making the syndicate experience special, all those the sort of benefits that we talked about earlier are what makes them special. But I think really think about that. Thank you too. What to avoid. Um, so over promising and under delivering uh, again, as ever, um, through your relationships with donors, but that's so easy to do in a syndicate, you put together this long list of benefits and you, you know, you think about it months in advance and we could invite them to that thing and, and make an event out of this. If you put that in writing, or you promise that to a donor in your cultivation meeting in person, and that doesn't happen, 
that one event that you described doesn't happen, um, then despite a really fantastic experience otherwise, that is often the thing that, that supporters will, will focus on and they will feel shortchanged like they were making a gift for a series of benefits which you haven't given them. So I would under promise it's much better to have things up your sleeve that you're pretty sure you can deliver and that really you plan to deliver through that process, but that you don't promise because then you're you're adding value to that um, to that donor. So we never say, for example, at English National Opera um, that as reviews come in, we're going to be sending you those reviews live and you'll get an email every day and new ones come in. But we always do it. Um, and that's just something that if we said we do it and then, you know, either human error, some, someone forgets or frankly, maybe the reviews aren't so good. So you don't want to push them too hard, um, which is allowed. Uh, then that could be something you're accused of of not following through with. So so I really um, that's why I'm talking about selling the the syndicate membership on on the principle rather than selling them on the benefits. Um, a, a really important thing to avoid uh, when you're thinking about syndicates is giving benefits that exceed the maximum benefit value. Um, I would, uh, we won't go through it uh, in great detail now, check the guidelines on HMRC. Those are, um, you know, legal maximum benefits. It's likely to be up to 5% of their gift, um, likely to be not over two and a half thousand pounds. Um, but you wouldn't want to be doing that anyway. So do stick to HMRC guidelines, but you wouldn't want to be spending if someone made a gift of 5,000 or even 10,000 pounds to join a, uh, a syndicate, you wouldn't want to be investing that much in, in that benefit anyway. Be creative about how you can give a great uh, experience to your syndicate members in inexpensive ways. So rather than lavish dinners at grand hotels for your syndicate, having them all in the cafe at which you're rehearsing or next door to where you're rehearsing and everyone having a croissant that you know the director's going to nip in or you know the soprano is going to nip in, as we talked about last week, because you promised the soprano a coffee and a class on before you get going, is a much better syndicate benefit and gets them much more, you know, part of the family, in the community, etc., cetera, than, than something lavish and grand. Um, those would be my top tips to avoid. Um, how you might transfer this um, giving group to another project I think if you possibly can, knowing your programming for the next three or four years, as almost certainly you will, or, or people in your organization will, understanding that before the first conversation, before you pitch them for this syndicate project, um, you want to focus on that syndicate probably. But if you can introduce that plan giving really early on, that's the best way, because then it's sort of always assumed. Um, the other, uh, if, if you don't have that opportunity, if you don't have that programming or it's not for sure, not for certain, um, then I would begin to trail future programming during the experience. So probably as you get closer to the production or the exhibition or the project, probably as you get closer to it, that might be a year down the line, you are then pretty aware of what the next project you might want them to support is going to be. And so in the um, Q&A event or at the croissant and um, breakfast, be focusing, of course, on the project which they're supporting, but start to talk about the next thing so that it doesn't come at the end of the whole project. It's, you know, all terribly formal. Thank you very much for that gift. Can we talk about the next, pro next project you might support? They've already started to get the feeling and they've already, therefore, you're doing that thing of getting them close, making them feel like part of the team, like part of the family, because they are they know about your future programming much further in advance than anyone else um, in your kind of membership base. Um, I mean, the best way to transfer a giving group to another project is giving them a great experience throughout. Do not fall into the trap of securing a dozen major donors to a project and then not, not carrying through the, the fantastic stewarding, making sure that you do deliver on every benefit that you promised and then doing more over delivering and under promising, making them feel really special. Um, and, then, and then the thank you at the end, 
Again, it's so easy. You will be doing lots of wash up when your project closes or when the production finishes or the exhibition comes down. You'll be doing lots of wash up and you'll want to think about the next thing. Make sure you're giving them a really great thank you. Um, we have something at English National Opera which we call the Curtain Down Report, which is a report that we pull together um, with statistics from audiences, with highlights of the reviews, with some great production shots. We always have two or three artists give us a sort of testimonial about why they love working on the project, um, what was special about it, et cetera. Um, and then that gets sent out to every member of the syndicate. Um, I, we also use that as a sort of conversation starter. So I'd love to share the curtain down report with you. Can we have a coffee next week? Um, uh, and in that conversation, you can then be talking to them about their next project. We put in that curtain down report information about the project that we'd like them to support next. Um, and then finally, uh, not letting things get cold. When your project finishes or on the opening night or day after every night, that syndicate will be on a massive high. You've delivered a fantastic production in our case. They've got really close. They've You've made them feel uh, quite rightly, appropriately, that you couldn't have done this production without them. They're on top of the world. That's the time to ask them when they've got that, that, that endorphin high. That's the time to ask them about supporting another the next project because they will be desperate to because they want that feeling again and they're feeling great if you let things get cold and say you know that's great i might talk to you next month about something or you know when we get some more information then um you will lose that 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 feeling that sense of excitement about joining the next one so do it as soon as you possibly can that i think is all from me um so we can take your questions Great, and we've already got quite a few in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, so uh, it would be good to understand the ROI of this type of endeavour. Sorry, this looks like we're in the same room, <laughs> so you can't see that, but we're um, And the resourcing, how much does it cost? What does it generate? Plus how many people are managing a syndicate to make it successful? Um, I think uh, maybe frustrating that sort of completely depends on your organisation um, and, and the need for the project. So, so how much is this project costing you? Um, I think the what I would say is that these do not have to cost a huge amount of um, a huge amount of money uh, on resources. They do take up quite a lot of capacity, and actually, it it is appropriate for them to take up capacity because you have to be delivering a really fantastic experience. I would not um, I would not go into starting a syndicate model unless you've mapped out the benefits that you are expecting to offer this syndicate um, and really started allocating time to individuals to deliver that. I would have that really um, clearly laid out in, in, your, um, in your minds before you commit to doing one. But I don't think the costs have to be huge. This, these are not about lavish dinners. They're not galas. They're not, um, you know, they, they don't even have to receive tickets, free tickets to the um, to whatever it is to the performance or the project etc our, our syndicate members um do not get freebies um they, they continue to buy their tickets it's about creating that community and about giving them that insight so that event for example with martin brabins where they sat down with the score is priceless but it frankly we did it at a member of the syndicate's house there was no cost for the um for the venue we bought half a dozen, a dozen bottles of wine from, you know, Tesco's around the corner and, and some crisps. That was it. You know, uh, there, there was no cost there other than the staffing costs of managing it, um, you know, creating the event, producing the event, having Martin's time, et cetera, et cetera. But I think um, the ROI you need really depends on, on your organisation and your, and your targets. Um, and then to pick up on that sort of benefit value, uh, how do you calculate the benefit value for the low key, but money can't buy, except it does events. Uh, it feels challenging to keep the benefit value below the threshold and just sort of how we think about that. Yeah, um, that, that's interesting. Uh, we've never really found that challenge of keeping it below the below the benefit threshold, because as much as possible, we are giving them the um, that kind of access to artists thing, which um uh which doesn't come with a direct cost or doesn't come with many direct costs um you know i would always be doing so again for example the the session that we have which people love are the um coffee mornings with casting 
and that we, you know, frankly, make the coffee in the office rather than going to, um, you know, um, a cafe. But you can go to a cafe and buying six coffees is not going to break the bank. Um, I would think about how you can just continue to stay really um, personal and give lots and lots of access to artists and access to experts and access to information rather than um, spending money on receptions and parties. And how do you think syndicates are similar or different from patrons groups or higher level membership or are they the same? I think um, the, the syndicate group for me is much more about specific um, specific projects, so specific repertoire or specific tastes, um, rather than the patrons program, which is much more of a kind of general, we love this organization, we want to be involved with every aspect of this organization, with every production, with every education program, etc. This syndicate model does a real deep dive and is really focused on one show or one education project or, or whatever it is. Um, and actually uh, really doesn't engage in anything, you know, the events that you're talking about doesn't engage in anything else the organization does. Super focused for um, real kind of uh, huge fans of that thing that the project's focused on. Um, so do pop any other questions. I'm, I'm just gonna ask you some yeah. as well. We've talked quite a lot about things being very production focused um, and very specific. Uh, and that's obviously a, a good focus. Uh, talk about, I suppose, education or other kind of aspects of, of work that you could package into a syndicate. Yeah, either package into or, or create a syndicate around. Certainly, um, we have uh, we have donors at, at English National Opera that support our education program specifically. Um, and at, uh, at my previous organisation, English Touring Opera, we had syndicates of donors supporting education projects. Um, and I think really the, the the model is very similar to everything we've talked about here being a being a production so we would have um coffee mornings for that syndicate at which we would have the people conceiving and delivering those um those learning participation programs so the people on the sort of front line going into schools or care homes or whatever it is talking about the um the impact of those we would have the sort of, uh, and again, we had a, a similar program at Spitalfields Music where we had a big care homes program, which was a um, piece of work we were really proud of, um, but needed a lot of funding. And we would have those cultivation evenings quite often um, where we would bring uh, big groups of prospects together and have the people delivering those programs. Obviously having participants is much more difficult, um, but the people delivering those programs, talking about giving their experiences of kind of being on the front line delivering those. And then where appropriate, um, the, the Care Homes project wasn't appropriate, but where appropriate, bringing your syndicate to, um, to performances or workshops. Um, and often the, um, the learning team and the schools will be really happy. Um, and certainly that's something we did a lot of English touring opera. We brought um, supporters into schools um, to observe workshops. And it's something we do here, we have a lot of uh, here at the Coliseum, we have a lot of schools that come in and do kind of Coliseum takeover days, and we have donors come and observe and sometimes participate and take part in, in those programmes. So again, that just feels really special. And I think one of the other things that really adds value to this, and you've talked about it all the way through, but not obviously, is just that internal buy-in, that fundraising is the job of everyone in your organisation, and to make these syndicates a success, you really need access to rehearsals, to yeah. what is going on. You need that culture of philanthropy, the culture that everyone, uh, fundraising is part of everyone's job. Not everyone is there to ask for money, but sharing what we do, sharing it in an open way uh, where possible, obviously certain directors. And again, there is a, a tension sometimes with certain directors who don't like anybody else in the rehearsal room and being able to, to work collaboratively with colleagues on the artistic side to know that this director um, might perhaps be a little bit grumpy or doesn't like people at these stages of the rehearsal room and finding ways that you can bring that experience around the personalities and the opportunities of what is happening. And again, similarly with education work, it's not always appropriate uh, to bring you know, additional adults into a space with vulnerable people. So working out how you can collaborate with everyone 
to get those stories, to get those insights. If it's not going into a care home or an education project, can you get the creative director of the project or the animateur to come and speak about the impact that it has? Can you get the teacher who is part of that to talk about it? So I think there is there is an awful lot of kind of internal networking as fundraisers that we do to make these things work. Mm -hmm. And then because of that relationship, having moments where someone will say, we have this the other day, uh, we have the most amazing scene change in Rheingold and you need to see it from backstage and you need to get your supporters to see it because we're so proud of the work we're doing. But because they have good relationships with us and they know what excites our donors, they're finding those additional bits that will just add that value. Again, it's uh, we got you know uh, a tripod and filmed it in the corner so we could share it with syndicate members. It was just a really nice extra, but because you've built a really good relationship with the organisation, people will come to you with stories that they know your supporters would like. Um, another question about what is particularly attractive for syndicates. Uh, well-known things, unknown things, new things, contemporary things, traditional things done in a traditional way? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I just wanted to, I, I loved your point on the last, the point you were making, Emery, and just to kind of um, add one thing, we make sure that really early in the rehearsal, um, in all the scheduling, rehearsals and, and scheduling generally across the organisation, that now, um, since we particularly since we've ramped up the syndicates a little bit, you know, in the last two seasons post COVID, that those moments where we hope to have engagement with artists and with the rehearsal room are in schedules at the very beginning before anyone see, you know, before they're published with anyone. If if a director or, or artists have a have a take issue with that, that's fine. We can work on it from there. But the kind of the assumption is it's in there, um, and that you are then communicating with. The stage management team, the artists, um, through their process, so that there are never any surprises. The, you know, you don't want to turn up to a, um, a supposed studio rehearsal um, session and no one expect you're there, and it will be quite uncomfortable. And they either don't even at all, which would be terrible, or um, you know, you're let in but not made to feel good. We have a fantastic stage management team at um, English National Opera who are brilliant anyway. But I think because we are communicating so regularly now when we arrive with donors they're made those donors are made to feel so special but so at home you know there's a seat already there for them um everyone is expecting them everyone comes up and you know because they've been briefed in the morning or whatever it is everyone comes up and introduces themselves um i think that's a really important um point about about scheduling um what to what to kind of make um uh syndicates around i think um it's the most successful uh syndicates are about the less and rare repertoire or more unusual work where you will have people that are um, hugely passionate and don't often get the opportunity to experience that thing. So um, it, you are probably more likely to have a, um, a syndicate, a successful syndicate, yeah, around in opera, for example, um, lesser known repertoire than a big Tosca or a big Bohem. For example um but then i think again as we talked about last week i think you need to follow trends in your organization and listen to your donors what does your current donor base love and follow that um if you find that you know um if, if we were to have found at, at english national opera that because the bohem is um you know uh, uh, it's a jonathan miller bohem that lots and lots and lots of our, our audiences love if that's a particular favorite of our donors, then we'll do a syndicate around Bowen um, and get them really, you know, you know, celebrate the kind of history of that production with the organization. Um, equally, there will be people in our donor base that, you know, really think that we as an organization should be pushing new work and contemporary opera or, or new adaptations of, of contemporary opera. Um, and so we might go down that route too. But but I think it's I think it's the real specialism stuff and it's not big famous rep. I would say. Great. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Oh, quickly, one last quick question. Unrestricted versus restricted gifts. Is that how you would differentiate between a patron and a syndicate membership? Yeah, so this would be a restricted gift, um, a restricted gift to this production. And you could also do it by art form if you were a multi-arts venue and yeah. have different things. You could have a syndicate that was all about theatre or visual art. Um, yeah. But 
lumping it into a, a, a very focused space. Um, David has put a survey in the chat um, and obviously this is part of Arts Council England and Chartered Institute of Fundraising and Culture Sector Network. Um, so there is a, as always, as fundraisers, we have to tell our donors what uh, what was being going on. So please do take a few minutes to do the survey. And up on the slide is next week's session, uh, which is looking all about legacy fundraising and why it's important. And it's a really, really growing area within arts and cultural organisations. Um, so we'll be sharing lots of insight from different organisations about how to get the best out of that. And back to you, David. Brilliant. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing so much insight into how you make syndicates and giving circles work, both at ENO and, and previous organisations. It's been a huge amount for people to take away and think about within their own organisations. Um, so really appreciate you giving your time yet again for, for today's session. Please do uh, fill out the, the survey. It's great to know what's worked, what things you think we can change and improve for future sessions. As Marina says, we've got one more session on individual giving with Dominic and, and Marina next week, looking at legacies. Straight after that, we're gonna jump into a new mini series looking at all things corporate fundraising. We're gonna be joined by uh, Rebecca Kendall and Ellie Mays at Rosendale Partnerships, who are going to go through that similar format to we've had for, for these sessions. So look out for more information about that. Uh, and just to reiterate Marina's point, huge thank you to the Arts Council who've uh, supported this series. Um, thank you to Rose, who's working behind the scenes to put this all together uh, and looking after all the booking and, and making all the recordings and things available to you as well. So again, look out for recording of, of most of today's most of today's sessions. You might have missed a little bit at the start. Um, and again, final thanks to, to Dominic and uh, Marina. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone.